kidney toxins. So let's talk about those. TMAO. So it's made in the gut. Um, it's cleared by the kidneys. So what happens is with the ingestion, particularly of like carnitine, choline, things that are found in um, red meat, poultry and eggs and fish, um, they, they, your body will produce something called TMAO. And TMAO, um, TMA, TMAO then goes to the liver and is converted into TMAO. And, um, and that is, is kidney toxin. It also increases the risk of heart disease. So here we are again, back at heart disease. Um, you want to decrease the production of TMAO, not only for your kidneys, but also for your heart. And then it also will increase inflammation in the body. We want less inflammation because inflammation causes scarring in the kidneys. It also causes, increases uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, and then the other two, P-cresyl sulfate and endoxyl sulfate. So these are to uh, toxic uremic, sol uremic solutes um, derived from, from these microbes in the gut. Um, they increase overall mortality. Here it is again. They increase cardiovascular disease. So if you eat a plant-based diet, you're going to decrease these levels by as much as 60%. We don't want our gut producing something that's toxic to our kidneys. We're trying to preserve our kidneys. So what can we do to improve our gut health? Into, into lower inflammation regarding food that we eat with our gut. Okay. So we want to limit or eliminate meat. Why is that? Because meat in and of itself is inflammatory. It has heme iron, which is inflammatory, secondary bile acids, which we just talked about. And then whenever you cook meat to a high temperature, it produces toxins called um, heterocyclic amines and polyaromatic hydrocarbons. You don't want those in your body. You don't want toxins in your body. You don't want anything that your kidneys have to filter out. Um, so prebiotic superpowers, dialysis patients need fiber, kidney patients need fiber, the historical nutrition for kidney disease, particularly in dialysis is a low fiber diet because of the fear of potassium and phosphorus, which I'm going to alleviate with for you before we get off here today. Um, but, uh, we definitely need more fiber. Now, another thing, um, this is, this is another just important information on the gut, um, just to improve gut health and lower inflammation in that way. But, um, you know, the, they're the largest gut study, the American gut health project. Um, it was the largest crowdsourced citizen, um, science project to date. Okay. And, um, so what they found, it was so simple. What came out of this, they did this big study and what they found was that the higher, um, uh, the more different types of plants a person eats, the higher the microbial diversity in their gut. And you want a lot of different bugs in there. You want good bugs, but a lot of different ones. Um, and so the people who ate more than 30 different fruits and vegetables or plants during a week had a more diverse gut microbiota than those who didn't. Um, so, and you may think, God, it's hard. Who can eat 30? But it's not as hard as you think. Like, for example, a Granny Smith apple and a Honeycrisp apple, that counts as two. So as long as they're just different, right? Um, but just do the best you can. Um, so, but another unexpected, um, result was that the detection of agricultural antibiotics and people who, um, claimed they hadn't taken antibiotics in years, because we know that they, um, give animals antibiotics um, when they're, you know, in these large factory farms. So this means that even if you eat meat, you can still end up with antibiotics that, that are going to harm your microbiome. And you don't want that. You want to preserve your microbiome to lower inflammation um, and lessen the load on the kidneys. So, and then also fermented foods, um, they also increase gut variety. That was, this was a different study, um, but uh, they lower inflammation, which we're trying to do soothe digestion and um, boost nutrient absorption and battle the bad bacteria. So this is just an image of just, you know, people will say sometimes, well, I mean, I don't know what I would eat if I just ate a plant-based diet. Okay. Please look at the variety in these pictures and then compare that to the variety you might find in meat. And then for fermented foods, um, just some examples. So like um, sauerkraut, which I happen to love. The top left is kimchi. I'm not a fan, but some people love kimchi. And so if you love kimchi, I definitely welcome you to eat that. Um, I wish I liked it. Um, kombucha tea, I love. And you can even do different plant-based yogurts. Um, I love, you may think this is crazy, but putting frozen berries, the frozen ones on that yogurt is so good. Um, and berries are, are super good for inflammation. Okay, 
So now let's talk about what we can do. So we've talked about what we could do with inflammation in acidosis, inflammation in proteinuria, inflammation in our gut. Let's talk about what we can do overall to protect our kidneys. Um, so nutrition strategies to cool inflammation. Uh, and this is now we're kind of going back to those antioxidants. So uh, with antioxidants, you have, again, like we, what we said with protein, um, with protein, you have protein that you eat and protein that your body breaks down. Your kidneys have to deal with both. Okay. To lower inflammation in your body um, and protect those kidneys from scarring, you can eat antioxidants and your body makes antioxidants. And we're going to talk about what this looks like. So when you, the dietary antioxidants kind of work on a one-to-one -one targeting. So they'll take, they'll take out one of those oxidants on one-to-one. -one. Um, and we're going to talk about how you know a food is high in antioxidants. And then we're going to talk about how your body makes antioxidants because these are a little bit stronger. They can handle a lot of oxidants at one time. Um, and then the pathway that helps you um, produce those, those, endogenous antioxidants. So um, exogenous antioxidants from the from the diet. So this is something called ORAC and it's called the oxygen radical absorbency capacity. You don't have to remember what that is, but what you need to know is it's just telling you the antioxidant capacity of food. Like does this food, does it have a high antioxidant capacity? The way they did this is they put the, they took a, um, a food and they put it in a test tube. And then uh, like one of these foods, okay? And then they put an oxidant in there and then another molecule that is very sensitive to oxidation. And they said, how does that food protect that molecule that's very sensitive to oxidation from the oxidant? And then they give it a score. So you can see here like acai berry is very high. But, um, and then go on down. I want you to look in the middle, well, middle to the bottom, dried oregano is so high. Um, Dried spices are super high in antioxidants. So this is a plus for you as a kidney patient because what we're, we're going to talk about salt later. We need to decrease our salt intake, but you can kill two birds with one stone here. You can season your food with dried spices, make your food taste great without the salt and boost your antioxidant um, a, a capacity in that food. Uh, you notice here that the animal protein is very low. Now, endogenous antioxidants, these are like an antioxidant enzymes. So they're called glutathione peroxidase, superoxide desmutase, and catalase. These three um, your body makes, but if you notice, you still need food sources for your body to be able to make these. And it tells you there, like you need selenium, you need copper, you need iron. Um, and so how do these, how do these neutralize free radicals? So remember over here on the left, you've got that oxidant, the oxygen there. And what it does is it has to go through a process through hydrogen peroxide to come out and produce something that's not toxic. So you'll see water on the other side. And so, but, but you'll see these endogenous antioxidants like the superoxide dismutase, the, the glutathione peroxidase, they come in and they convert the H2O2, the hydrogen peroxide to water. So that's how they work. You don't necessarily have to remember that, but what you want to know is that you need your body to make these endogenous antioxidants. And how do they do that? Well, there's a pathway called NRF2. And it's the master regulator for our for our body's antioxidants, um, endogenous antioxidants. And like I said before, even though your body's making these, they've got to have the raw material to upregulate this pathway so your body will um, make these endogenous antioxidants. Well, look, here it is again. Fruits and vegetables. These are the foods that are going to not only are they high in antioxidants themselves, but they cause your body to make endogenous antioxidants. So, um, again, we need more fruits and vegetables. Okay. So I know that was a lot on inflammation, but it's really important because the reason inflammation is so important for kidney disease, it increases scarring, but, um, kidney disease in and of itself is inflammatory and it will damage other parts of the body. It will increase your risk for cardiovascular disease. And so if you are a kidney patient, we need to cool inflammation, not just to slow progression and scarring of the kidneys, but to slow other, what we call comorbidities, other things like cardiovascular disease that you're already more prone to because you already are more inflamed because your kidneys aren't working like they should.